tribal trails The Son of God, He is near He chose to walk with us These tribal trails Tribal trails Hi and welcome to Tribal Trails. We're at uh, Dr. Gary Parker and uh, today we're going to be talking about life before birth and we've heard lots about it in the news and that so can you tell me what 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 you wrote here? This is your book? Yes. Uh -huh. You know even non-Christian people, even evolutionists, you know, sometimes talk about the miracle of birth. You know it's just utterly astonishing uh, that, uh, you know, human life physically uh, starts as a little round ball about the size of a period on a printed page, you know, just barely visible. Yet in that little round ball, there's uh, two meters, six feet of DNA all coiled up with all of the instructions, you know, hair color, eye color, skin color, height, you know, weight, uh, aptitudes, all kinds of stuff all spelled out ahead of time. It's just absolutely incredible. Uh, and, uh, you know, it just, it just, it's just Psalm 139 yeah. <laughs> written out in science. You know, David talks about how even before he had any physical being or form, God knew all the words he would speak. And so life really begins before conception as a plan in the mind of God, our creator. Uh, and then Psalm 139 continues. David talks about how God beheld his unformed substance. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Well, scientists as late as the 16 and 1700s uh, thought that human beings started from miniature human beings. And the big debate was whether the miniature human being was in the egg cell or the sperm cell. <laughs> but the Bible had it right. You start as an unformed substance, a lump of clay in the potter's hand, or, or like the earth at creation without form and void. And then he continues, you're knit together. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You know, I think of watching my grandmother, you know, knit a sweater. The plan's already there. Everything's there. Then she's got the material, and then the plan gives shape to that material to accomplish the Creator's purpose, whether my grandmother knitting a sweater or God creating a human life. It's just awesome. Uh, embryology, the study of, uh, you know, development of the embryo, is a typical uh, pre-med weed-out course in college. <laughs> <laughs> the, everything is so precise and so well organized and there's so many terms and there's so many sequences uh, that if you can't get through that there's no point in trying to be a doctor so it, it was but it was one of my very favorite courses and uh, it's just all inspiring but <laughs> uh, evolutionists came along and spoiled the whole thing and so uh, Darwin uh, you know, made the claim that, uh, you know, the human embryo goes through stages of evolution. Uh, and in uh, fancy terms, uh, this is what I used to love to say as an evolutionist, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. <laughs> the development of the individual in the womb retraces the evolution of the group. And so you start off as the amoeba stage, uh, and then you evolve, you know, into the fish stage. Uh, with gill slits, and then you evolve into the reptile stage, you know, with the tail. And, uh, and so, you know, you can just see evolution unfold before your very eyes. Of course, now we can take pictures of the living embryo developing in the womb. That is really astonishing. Uh, but he, Darwin was joined by uh, Ernst Haeckel, who's sometimes called Germany's Darwin. Uh, and he, he was even worse than Darwin about this. And so um, he actually, you know, tried to draw human embryos and the embryos of fish and, and dogs and cats and anything else he could think of. 
Uh, but he tried to make them look, he actually fudged his diagrams to make animal embryos look more human-like and human embryos look more animal-like. And he got caught. And his big defense was, well, everybody else does it. <laughs> <laughs> so they were really weren't looking for the truth about life before birth. They were looking to make evolution sellable. And, uh, on, and then here's the, the horror of it. He did this in 1860. And so Haeckel's diagrams were exposed as fraudulent, not 1960, 1860, okay, way back when. Well, I was a guest lecturer at a community college uh, uh, in Florida. Uh, one of my former students was a professor there, and he invited me to come over. And uh, so I did a class, and then he was doing an embryology lab. I'm looking through his lab manual. This is, was a 2007 copyright on a lab manual about embryonic development, life before birth. We have it on video. We've got all kinds of three-dimensional things. We've got color relief. What did they have? They had Haeckel's diagrams from 1860 in a 2007 embryology lab manual. Why? Because the truth is anti-evolutionary. They had to keep the lie in order to maintain the lie. It, it was just shocking. And of course, by the way, I think it backfires. <clears throat> when uh, you know, students learn about this, you know, they, they begin to feel cheated. You know, why'd you do that? You know, why, why? And of course, they've seen the real pictures anyway. They probably thought, what, what are these diagrams doing in the book? For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? But, okay, it really is true that at a certain stage, you know, about a month after conception, um, you can say, oh, there's some little folds in the neck here. Yeah, those could be, and they're popularly called gill slits, you know, leftovers of our fish ancestry. Uh, and, <clears throat> uh, you know, there's a, the baby's, the end of the baby's spine actually sticks out noticeably. Wow, you know, it looks like a tail. Okay, we actually see, there it is, proof positive, yolk sac, uh, like you find in a chicken or a reptile, you know, as a source of nutrient for the baby. That's just a throwback to the reptile stage, the fish stage, and the monkey stage in human evolution. <laughs> and so that's the way it's often presented, but none of those things are true. Darwin and Haeckel together listed 180 useless leftovers of evolution in the human before birth. Science has since shown they were wrong 180 times, 100% error. Everything they thought was a useless leftover has been discovered to have uh, human function at the present time. And so, wow, okay, so what, what about that? You know, if you look at the little human embryo, you do see some folds in the neck, and they make pouches growing out from the throat. Well, in fish, these pouches break through to the outside, so fish take in water, and it goes out over the gills, and they extract oxygen from water. What do they do in us? Do they, well, we're not fish anymore, so they just appear and then disappear? No. Those pouches develop into things that we need as human beings. So the first pair develop into the palatine tonsils that help fight disease. Okay, so they're important to us. Second pair develop into the middle ear canals that regulate pressure in your ear. I have trouble with that. I know how important they are. <laughs> uh, and the third and fourth pair become two glands you can't live without, the parathyroid glands to regulate calcium and the thymus gland to make T cells, killer cells that protect our body from cancer and other kinds of harmful changes. So they're distinctively human things. Now, once in a while, a baby's born with a little hole in the neck. The pouch will go too far and break through to the outside. And that's when you know for sure it's not a gill slit. There's no collection of capillaries going in there to try desperately to extract oxygen from the air. No, it's just a mistake in embryonic development. And it means something that we need is missing or not in the right place. And so again, they were wrong every single time. And the yolk sac, we call it a yolk sac because people know yolks from chick eggs and things like that. But our yolk sac 
doesn't have any yolk in it. And so an evolution says, well, obviously that's a vestigial organ. A yolk sac with no yolk can't possibly have a function. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> it, it also has a function in chickens and in lizards that have a yolk with yolk in it. But in both cases, the yolk sac forms the first blood cells for the developing embryo and the first blood vessels. And these blood vessels carrying the first blood cells enter the embryo's body, fuse to form beating vessels that become the heart. But you have to have the blood first in order to form the blood vessels in the heart that will later pump this blood. And so why not use a structure that's available right at the beginning to make these cells that after it's completed, it's fully human function and providing us with blood cells and blood vessels, then it can just be discarded. Just like in, in the lizard and the chicken, it's discarded both because it's made the first blood cells and because they've used up the yolk. We don't need the yolk part because we get our, nourishment's mother, our nourishment from our mothers uh, through her bloodstream exchange with the placenta. So again, nothing unhuman about that at all. <sighs> but what about the tail? Okay, it really is true. If you see a picture of an embryo about a month after conception, the end of the spine will stick out noticeably. A tail? No. It's just the end of the spine. And as the uh, muscles of the hips and legs develop, that little hook of bone winds up inside the body as an important part of our spinal cord. And so the little hook of bone at the end, uh, the coccyx and sacrum, actually are attachments for muscles necessary for our upright posture as human beings and actually for the operation of the lower end of the alimentary canal. <laughs> so we'd be in real trouble if this thing wasn't there. <laughs> and if you've ever fallen down, slipped on the ice or something like that, uh, it landed on your, quote, tailbone, unquote, you can't sit down, lie down, do much at all, but moan and groan. You know, it's necessary for our upright posture. But I, I was sharing these things in a, a meeting somewhere, and sure enough, somebody brought me up a magazine, Baby Born with a Tail. Let's see. It's that prestigious scientific journal. Oh, yeah, Parade Magazine. Okay, Sunday supplement. <laughs> and there was a baby born in India with a tail. Or was it? Okay, the parents, by the way, were actually really enthused about this. They thought it was a sign of, uh, you know, specialness about their child, a gift from the gods and all that. They didn't want, doctors wanted to snip it off. But no, 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 we want to keep this. <laughs> so there are different attitudes about this. But was it a tail? No. What it tells us is how the nerve cord forms in the spine. It's really incredible, but the nerve system, your brain and your spinal cord, start off as open patches of skin on the back and they roll up into mountain ridges around the rim of the future brain and spinal cord, and then these mountains lean over and touch and form the brain and the spinal cord with a little hollow tube down the spinal cord and cavities in the brain that are very important to its function. Uh, and then the skin is drawn over the top of that. Well, once in a while, the rolling shut doesn't go far enough and a baby's born with an open patch of spine, spina bifida. Well, that's bad news because uh, the baby's going to die of infection unless you quickly seal it over. And even if you seal it over quickly after birth <clears throat> so they don't die of infection, they still risk uh, some problem, possibility of uh, malfunction in the spinal cord or brain from lack of proper pressure adjustment. You don't know. There may not be any problem. It may be mild. It may be severe. You don't really know until a child develops a little further. Uh, but and so some doctors don't even want to want to try to save the baby. But really, uh, most of the time, it's fine if you just seal that shut. But nobody says that proves we evolved from an animal that had an open patch of spine. Well, sometimes the skin rolls too far and it goes past the spine and you get a tail. No, you get a little bit of extra skin and fat. A tail has bone in it, muscle in it, blood vessels in it, nerve cord in it. The so-called tail that you see on some babies is just a little bit of extra skin and fat. And when they do jokes about this, you know, they did this on a Seinfeld show one time. You know, it shows the tail, you know, wiggling back and like it had muscle and bone. And, nah, it's, it's just a little bit of extra skin and fat. Normally, the doctor just snips it off. 
because you don't want to even tell a mother about it, start this big argument. Ah, I've given birth to a throwback to the monkey stage in evolution. It's your side of the family. No, it's your side <laughs> of the family. So just snip it off and let it go. I was totally wrong about those things, and yet that's still taught. I think I mentioned in another program, a uh, high school teacher in New Brunswick tried to use that as an argument for evolution, and the college professor I was debating in the evening agreed with me uh, that that had been disproven years ago and ought to not be in the textbooks anymore. And, but it didn't stop there. Uh, they also, you know, once, in fact, you know, sometimes I'll ask older members of an audience, did you ever have a time when you were young and healthy and your parents said, if you go to the doctor and have those awful tonsils removed, you can have all the ice cream you want for a week? Because they thought tonsils <clears throat> were a useless leftover of evolution. And so they just rip them out, healthy tonsils. Well, my son has the biggest tonsils I've ever seen. I don't even know how he can swallow food. <laughs> but I don't think he's ever had a cold. The tonsils are frontline soldiers in the fight against disease and respiratory infections. They're really valuable to us. Now, if they get diseased, they may have to be removed. If your heart gets diseased, you may have to remove it and have a heart transplant. Does that prove the heart is a useless leftover of evolution? I, mean, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so. And one that means a little of appendix. You know, there are all kinds of jokes about the appendix. The, uh, you know, if there is a God, he created the appendix just to make the surgeons rich. Okay, well, my father was a surgeon without being rich. Okay, that's possible. <laughs> uh, but the appendix is actually really vital to human beings. Its most important work is done before birth. So if you do have your appendix removed later, it can get diseased. And, you know, rupture would be real bad, so you may have to take it out. But before birth... It's activated the cells that produce antibodies. And so it's an extremely important part of our immune system. After birth, it continues to play a major role. It's right there at the end of the cecum uh, in uh, you know, food allergies and protecting the, the body against invasion. We, bacteria in the intestine are really vital and very helpful, but not if they get in the bloodstream. And so the appendix helps regulate that throughout life, but their main job was done before birth. So you can lose it, you can use an arm later. It doesn't mean you're not human or anything like that, or it's a useless leftover. It just means something happened to it. And so you had to, had to remove it. It was worth the price. So all 180 organs they taught were useless leftovers. They've all found functions for them. A little bump between the left and right hemispheres of the brain, the pineal gland, Darwin thought it was a useless leftover of a third eye in our reptilian ancestors. <laughs> okay. Well, good stirring stuff. <laughs> and it is light sensitive, not really light this way, but through the eyes transmitted back to it. And uh, that's a hormone gland that actually makes the melatonin that regulates how awake or how sleepy we feel. And some of us, like me, a melatonin now is marketed, you know, as a sleep aid. And uh, I'm never going to take one. Because uh, I've got to have a lot of sunlight to shut down melatonin synthesis, or I'm just really sleepy. I, I love being in Canada, uh, you know, in the summer when the days just go on and on and on. <laughs> I'd have a terrible time. I've been up here in the winter plenty of times, but boy, oh boy, the, it's not the cold. The cold I can handle, it's the, the darkness. You know, I just can't, even in Florida, when it's just cloudy and overcast endlessly, you know, I just, I'm, I'm like a green plant, I wilt. And so, uh, you know, I need a lot of sunlight just to keep awake. Sunlight suppresses the melatonin and lets you wake up. And so, again, you know, it's an important human function. And uh, so you can look at this and you say, what, the baby before birth really retraces not stages in evolution, stages in creation. God's plan laid out in DNA from the beginning. Uh, the unformed substance, the material of the living cell that the DNA can act on, knit together step by step in your mother's womb according to the plan that was there from before the foundations of the earth. You can say that to college students. If you say it to first graders, they're going to say, well, what about my cousin that was born with a defect? Does that mean God made a mistake? And what do I say? Time for me to go to work, ask your mom. <laughs> so kids always ask those kind of embarrassing questions. What, what does that mean? Now, what it means is a mutation occurred 
and mutations aren't the raw material for evolutionary progress. They're the source of disease, disease organisms, and birth defects. Well, why are there mutations? Because man's sin ruined God's perfect world, God withheld. You know, that is originally created us to eat and to live forever. Uh, but because of our sin, he didn't want us to live forever in sin. I didn't understand that when I was a non-Christian, but he had better plans for us. And so our death, you know, talk about, you know, ultimately turning bad to good, <laughs> you know, becomes new life, rich and abundant and eternal forever. And so remember when the, uh, Jesus healed the man born blind? Well, he got his sight back. When did he really heal the man born blind? Gave him his sight right away, but then he got old and died. He really healed him when he got a glorified body to live forever in the presence of his living Lord. <laughs> I kind of caution people when somebody's sick, it, you maybe want to be careful about praying for them to be healed because God might heal them completely. <laughs> Yeah. So they'll never feel pain or suffering yeah. again. And maybe what you really want is a patch-up job. So they'll stay here on earth with you for a little while longer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but once again, the things that we see in God's world point back not just to the truth of God's word, but for the love and the intention behind those works. Yeah. And God everywhere is drawing us to himself. He couldn't possibly uh, you know, open his arms any wider or be more obvious in his care and concern for us. Don't, don't turn your back on that. Accept it. Why not? Well, you know, he's not only your father, but your loving father. Some of us had fathers that would remind us of Christ, some not. But the real father will never let us down. See how very much our father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know Him. Well, evolutionists were certainly wrong about useless leftovers, but perhaps the worst uh, thing that evolution has done for us is the widespread acceptance of abortion. Uh, you know, there aren't even that many primitive cultures that practice abortion. Well, who would have ever thought the most dangerous place to be is your mother's womb? You know, more, uh, you know, People die without ever having a chance to be born. Uh, and why? Well, the evolutionists, nah, you know, we're, we're not, at first they were saying we're not sure whether the embryo is alive. Well, that was silly. You know, they have all the marks of life, so they quit saying that. But then they started saying, well, this is the amoeba stage. You know, this is the, the jellyfish stage. This is the fish stage. This is a reptile stage. This is the, it's not really a person. Now, how they can do that with what we know, what we see, what we observe. You know, the baby's sucking his thumb, practicing swimming at six months. And yet they can, you can have partial birth abortion. There's no way that's anything except murder. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't put any different kind of connotation to it. And yet somehow evolutionists, you know, evolution is a culture of death. You know, it glorifies death. Time, chance, struggle, and death is a pathway to progress. And if we get rid of unwanted children, it just makes more room for the fitter to survive. Uh -uh. <laughs> God is the one who created that life. God is the one who has a plan and purpose for that. Even a life that uh, you know, involves a certain amount of pain and suffering, wow, is worth a living. And that's only temporary. You know, even Paul said, you know, I consider the present difficulties not worthy to be compared with the glory that we'll see when we're restored to our relationship with Christ. Thank you for sharing that with us today. My pleasure again. <laughs> the Word of God teaches us that, uh, you know, God loves us so much. That's, that's what it emphasizes a lot. Uh, the unfailing love of God, that it endures forever. It says that quite a few times in the Old Testament, and it says that in the New Testament too, quite a bit. And that's what God wants us to know, that he, His love endures forever. You know, and that He loves each one of us. That, you know, you, you, people listening on TV, I just pray that you would sense that about, about uh, God with you, that God created each one of us. You know, sometimes we fall so far away from God and we feel so undeserving of His love. You know, no matter how far you feel you are from God, God loves you and God desires you. And if you take one step toward God, no matter how deep, deep in sin you, you feel you might be, you take one step 
toward him, he'll come running, you know, because he loves you so much and he desires you. And this song kind of, you know, emphasizes that. In my life, I, I, I can honestly say that I struggled with life because I felt so unlovable at times, you know, and uh, even uh, to the point where I just wanted to take my life. You know, I feel like young people are like that today too. You know, they struggle with life and they struggle to feel like they're really loved in their lives. And I just pray that you would sense God's love for you. And even in, in, uh, in the Word of God, the Bible calls us, uh, tells us two things, right, about, about life. Two commands. One, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second one, it says it's like, like the same. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. And I sense that in, in the Word, God calls us as followers of Jesus Christ to be ones to, 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 to show His love to the world. And the best way we can show it is by showing love to each other. You know, even though we might have differences in our lives, the main thing is that we continue to love each other. And through that love, others are drawn to the Lord. And this song I kind of wrote when I was struggling, you know, uh, with the desire to, you know, with a sense of being loved uh, even by others. But here, I just kind of drew upon God's love to, to give me strength. It's called, uh, You Love Me, Lord. I walk beside 